Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show some love to that subscribe button and don't forget the notification bell. Turn that one to on so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to gift me a coffee as a special thank you, all the information can be found down below. Now, without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the very first really short story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. It was the fourth week of summer camp. I was a camp counselor up in the mountains. It was the weekend and during that time, there were no campers on site. It was only us seven counselors. Everyone but Alex was chilling in the break room. Alex was assigned to stay in the Hawk cabin alone because he was the only guy working that weekend. It was late and Alex had gone to sleep. He started to dream. In his dream, he saw a little girl dancing on top of one of the bunk beds and singing, I'm Riley, I'm Riley. Then she looked at Alex and jumped off the bunk bed and broke her leg. In a panic, Alex woke up to check the room for any little girl. The room was empty, but Alex was too spooked to sleep again. So he went down to the break room for some company. A minute later, our boss walked in and asked Alex, who was that little girl who stumbled out of your room? A day later, after everyone had stopped shitting their pants, a new batch of campers arrived. On the first day, we took a bunch of cabins on a hike. On the trail, we were singing camp songs and getting to know everyone. My campers were telling me all the cool dreams they remembered. I told them about a dream while I was in zero gravity. Then this girl in front of me turned around and said she had a scary dream a few nights ago. She dreamt that it was in a hawk cabin and that there was this little girl trying to dance around with a broken leg. Sometime in the late 2000s, my family was coming back from visiting some extended family. This was in a somewhat rural and industrial Midwest state. My memory is horrible, but I remember this extremely brief encounter so vividly. My dad was driving with my grandma, mom, brother, and me in the car. I was in my late teens at the time. It was dusk and would soon be getting dark. We were on the back roads because my grandma was navigating and didn't know what a highway was. There was some industrial buildings and stuff around, but it's all shut down or abandoned, and they are few and far between. So we are cruising along, and my grandma spots a person in one of those big electric wheelchairs that, like, lays back. They are just sitting in an empty lot by the road. It was so out of place, and there was nobody around, and it was starting to get dark. My grandma was a saint and really wanted to stop and see if they needed help, but I had a horrible feeling and felt sick thinking about it. I voiced my concerns about how something seems very wrong, and luckily my dad agreed with me and did not stop. It was a fraction of a second encounter. We didn't even slow down, but we tried to figure out what to do for a couple of minutes after we passed. I'm sorry if I'm a horrible person for not wanting to stop, but I had that nauseous feeling that this was something bad. I don't know if it was a trap or someone who needed help or someone just hanging out for some strange odd reason.
This happened back when I used to get on Grinder, but it always reminds me of how glad I am that I'm no longer doing the online dating thing. There's quite a bit of backstory before the creepy, so if you aren't interested in that, feel free to skip. For those unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a gay dating app that shows guys nearby. It makes you use your location while using the app, but it doesn't give your exact location unless you send it to the person directly. Anyways, I got a message from a blank profile. No name, no picture, and no bio. The only thing that popped up was how close he was. Less than a mile. This happens a lot because there are a lot of closeted guys out there, especially back then. Being an overweight guy in the gay community, I had to take anything I could get because most gay guys in my community wouldn't even give me the time of day. He started off nice enough, introduced himself as Jesus, and asked how I was doing and all of that sort of small talk. He told me he was into chubbier guys and after exchanging pictures, we both agreed that we found each other attractive. He asked me if I'd like to come over and play video games and maybe have some fun. I'd only met a couple of guys off Grinder, and although we had some good times, it ultimately didn't pan out. However, I had met him somewhere public first, so I never met anyone at their place or had anyone over to mine. I figured it had been long enough and some casual fun might be nice. Plus, he was really cute and actually my type. He agrees to come pick me up since I'm only a few blocks away. Apparently, he lived in the nearby trailer park. I decided I'd like to shower first, and he says he'll head over. Then, he says he's really embarrassed to ask, but wonders if I'd be willing to lend him $20. Supposedly, he lived with his mom, and she had left for the weekend without any food money for him. I know it was really stupid in hindsight, but I felt really bad for him. I tell him I don't have any cash, but he says that's okay. I can just send him some money through an app. I don't remember what it was called, but it was something like Venmo. I go ahead and send it, take my shower, and then let him know I'm ready. He says he's heading out, but can't find his keys. I say it's okay, I'll just wait outside for him. I hadn't given him my address yet, but I was almost ready to. However, when I asked if he had found his keys, he never responded. Minutes went by, then an hour. I messaged him again to ask if he was still coming, and I could see him going on and offline. So, I know he read my messages. I finally just accepted he was ghosting me and probably just wanted money. I messaged him one last time and told him that it was pretty fucked up as well, as explained that had he just asked, I would have given him the money without having to go through all of that. What can I say? I can be a softie sometimes. Fast forward a couple of weeks. I never heard back from him, so I just blocked him. I get another message from someone on Grinder relatively close to me. His profile is all blank, which raises my suspicions. He tells me he's also into chubby guys, which really makes me suspicious because it's highly unlikely two chubby chasers live so close to me. We trade pictures again, and it's a different dude. However, he suddenly asks for money again. In Grinder, you can create as many accounts as you'd like. All you need is an email address. There were tons of spam accounts on there that are automated. It was a real pain in the ass. Anyways, I called him out because I was like 95% sure it was Jesus. At first, he acts like he doesn't know what I'm talking about, calls me crazy, and then he blocks me. I felt a little bad because I thought maybe I had made a mistake and just chased off a guy for nothing. Then again... His sudden offensive reaction made me have doubts. Now, on to the let's not meet part. Weeks go by, and every so often this same guy tries to fool me even though I don't fall for it. Eventually, I blow up on him and ask him what the fuck his problem is. 
We start going at it, and he eventually says, You won't say that shit to my face. I tell him that I would gladly tell him to fuck off in person. Not that I expected him to actually show up this time. He responded with, All right, we'll see about that. Be there soon. Now, I was a little worried at this point because it crossed my mind that he may not actually be gay and might be some homophobe looking to bash some gay guys. My mind always goes back to these men who have been murdered after meeting up with someone on Grindr. However, I realized I never gave him my address. Me. Nice try, but I'll never give you my address. Yes, you did, stupid. You just didn't know it was me. Be ready. I'm on the way. At this point, my anxiety starts setting off because I did give my address to a guy who had to cancel at the last minute. But I didn't think anything of it because it was before Jesus had messaged me a second time. I tried to think about what to do, so I decided to try and document his threat. I know I didn't give you my address. Besides, what do you want with me anyway? You'll see. I've got something for your ass. Now, the trailer park is always having police go by there, and my neighborhood is separated by a bayou. At night, I always heard gunshots out there, so I began to panic. What if he had a gun? What if he brought friends with him? Oh, yeah? And what's that? Something that'll shut you up. I'm outside. Get out here. I started freaking out because I couldn't tell he was just trying to mess with me or if he really was outside. I had been screenshotting everything and sent it to the grinder admins to report him for credible threats of violence. I wasn't sure if I should call the cops or not because if he was lying, I didn't want to look stupid. Plus, I wasn't sure if it was even enough for them to do anything. I decided to peek outside from the stairs and see if I could spot him. If I can get the make and model of his car, maybe I could at least have something to give to the cops. I live in the middle of a cul-de-sac, so when I looked out the window, I can see all the way to the end of the street. When I looked out, I saw a car I'd never seen before parked on the side of the road at the end, my heart was pounding because I just knew it was him. But a part of me was hoping it wasn't. I decided I'd test him and see if he really was out there. Him. I'm waiting. I'm outside already. Where are you? Of course I wasn't, but if that was him and he did know my address, then why wouldn't he just park right outside my house? Sure enough, I was right. Yeah, I see you. You're going to get it now. Then give it to me. I'm right here. Just you wait. I knew he couldn't see me from his car because I was peeking out discreetly and our windows have a privacy shade on them where people only see a black screen from outside. A few more minutes go by and the car takes off. I have a feeling that he used Grinder to triangulate the area of my neighborhood. But of course, he couldn't find my exact address because it hadn't been him who I'd given my address to. Grinder later sent me a message saying it's been banned from the app and they'd contacted the local authorities. I never heard anything else after that, so I don't know what became of it. The cops never contacted me if they did pay him a visit, and I never heard from him again. Now, I'm married, so I don't use Grinder anymore, thankfully. Still, it took a while before I was able to sleep soundly after that. I rarely left the house, and when I did, I always made sure his car wasn't around anywhere. In hindsight, he was probably just a stupid kid wanting to troll people. Still, creepy grinder guy? Let not meet.
Forgive me if I ramble, but I'm kind of high and want to share my story to know if this is truly a weird experience or I have overanalyzed shit. I've told this story to everyone I know and my family knows about it. Sort of. But I honestly feel like I have trust issues and PTSD from this experience. But I'm obviously not the person who had the worst. All right. When I was a baby, a family lived next door who had a baby my age. We became friends, and even after she moved away, as her parents had more kids, we stayed close. My parents worked a lot, and her mom was a stay-at-home mom. Typically, so often, I would play at their house. When I was an older child, about nine-ish, my dad got diagnosed with cancer, and my house got tough to live in. So, on weekend and vacations, I would spend long stretches of time with them, sometimes days a week or so at a time. They had three kids going on four at this point, all around three years apart. They all had some type of health problem. They were always sick, hospital visits, heart issues, seizures. One kid did have epilepsy, but was born after undiagnosable things that came and went. The kids missed school. I found hidden truancy violation letters. The husband had an illness too, but they were more severe, and I always felt it could be the stress of caring for such a large family. And the mom has some weird neurotic behaviors. She would always force me to look in her nose and throat to make sure nothing was stuck. She refused to run errands or leave the house alone. And if she thought I was awake, she would force me over her children to go out and do them with her and often left her children home alone for what felt like minutes to her. Hours. My mom would call to come pick me up from her house after work and she would make sure we weren't home for hours. There were no cell phones really back then. So it would seem like my mom did not want to come get me and I would have to spend the night there again. When we ate, she often had me eat different food than her kids. Not always, but often enough that I and they noticed and commented on it. I was 10 to 12 years of age and had a full on eating disorder at this point. So I was generally grateful as the food she fed me was generally vegetable based and the kids would often eat junk food. I didn't think much about it until I was maybe 10 or 11, watching The Sixth Sense for the first time and getting fascinated and a little paranoid with the disease that I thought the behaviors mirrored this. As I got older toward my teenage years, I became more independent. And after my father passed, I made new friends, which the mom didn't like. I recall a Facebook account made for one of the daughters, who was five at the time, and found my new best friend, or current best friend, and messaged her, kind of aggressively, asking her what we did together and where I was in a way that, obviously, a five-year-old would not do. My best friend found it weird enough to tell me, and after that, I disassociated with her family, mainly entirely. I told my mom, and she agreed it was weird, but nothing else came of it. I also remember several times coming home, and there would be a message in our phone that the mom was outside, or had tried to stop by, or had waited a long amount of time for me and my mom to get home if we were out. I don't remember this so clearly, but I know it was frustrating to my mother. Then, when I was in high school, I had a mutual friend that actually was kicked out by his family for being gay and was adopted by the family. He wouldn't have lived with them for more than a year when he emancipated himself and became homeless over living with that family. Most recently, the family has moved across country, and it seems they still have health issues that persist. But it's hard to know the degree through the internet. The kids are now all in their teens or 20s, 
and I don't know much about them anymore, to be quite honest. I didn't want to say anything really disrespectful because as a whole, the kids were great and I knew their mom loved her kids. It just seems so odd then and looking back. I'm glad I was able to grow up apart from them when I did. Is this the part where I put let's not meet? Because I certainly hope not to again. All right, dear listeners, this next story is broken up into three parts, but I'm going to read it as one. I will announce one, two, and three. Here we go. Story number one, True Night Watchman Experience. I will admit first off that I had heard of these deep web, dark web stories and have always called bullshit. However, a close friend of mine swore that she had been to this place and that she had seen some really fucked up things. Some she would talk about, others she would refuse. She said some of the things she had seen would haunt her for the rest of her life. I should have just let it go at that, but I wanted to believe that she was making it all up and that there was no such place. But I was the one that was wrong. You know the drill by now. I downloaded Tor. Onion and found the hidden wiki. I had been warned about some of the links and how they can trick you into some really crazy and horrible things. I clicked a few. They were mostly sex meetups, escort requests, drug deals, needless to say. I was really starting to think I was right and that the deep web was just an easy way to make shady deals that couldn't be traced. It was lame tame and a little bit boring. I looked around for something remotely interesting until I found the link, The Watchman. Okay, this could be interesting. I was thinking it might be some guy telling creepy stories or walking around a sleepy town at night or something interesting. What greeted me was a flat black page with three videos blown up to cover the space sitting side by side in a line. They were paused, and on each of them was a picture of different people. The first one had a family of four, mom, dad, and two little girls. The second was a couple with the female being very obviously pregnant. The third was just one woman and her dog, a cute black lab with a white streak over his left eye. Before I could study them for too long, a voice came through. It was male, but slightly distorted, so I couldn't really hear what he actually sounded like. Here is what he said. Good evening. Tonight, the Watchmen have brought you three unique households. Each of them lives different lives, believe different things, have different future plans. He stops here and clears his throat. For this next part, it sounded like he was smiling. <clears throat> Watch each video and then choose one. I really didn't understand the point of this task, but honestly, my interest was piqued. I was curious about where this was going. I clicked the first video. There wasn't much to it. It showed the family in our home, skipping through moments of them watching TV, playing in the backyard, having supper, the parents putting the kids to bed, starting to make love. It cut off there. Thank you, God. I was starting to feel like a weird creep. I was seeing a part of people's lives that were meant for them only. I reluctantly clicked on the next video. I was transported into the home of a young couple getting ready to start a family. It skipped through to them into the baby's room, hugging and generally looking excited. They ate salads at the kitchen table, went through mail, looked through baby books and magazines, watched a show on TV, and then went to bed, snuggling up together. This one was so sweet I couldn't help but smile at what I had just seen. However, I was still a warrior in their personal moments. I had gone through the others. I figured it was only right to watch the last one. This one was a single woman living with just her dog. 
She was a bit of a slob. She had dishes piled up, laundry on a love seat in the living room, and trash that was overflowing. The other two had been pretty tidy, the family having some toys and laundry lying around. The couple with a very clean house. I wondered if there was a point to that, since it did show these aspects in the videos. Anyway, the woman seemed lonely. She watched a lot of TV, ate a half gallon of ice cream, checked her cell phone every few moments, obviously hoping for a call or a text, played fetch with her dog, fed him, and then went to bed, taking her phone with her. She began to masturbate, and I began to feel incredibly awkward. Thankfully, this one ended there as well. I waited to see what was next. The video reset and went back to the stills of each one again. The voice came back over and said, Now that you have seen, which one will you choose? I sat there and watched, praying that someone else was there watching this too, and would choose, but nothing happened for a few minutes. The videos disappeared, and another three videos began playing simultaneously. These had turned my stomach. There were three tall men. I assumed that they were men by what character I could catch. They each wore the same clothing, black shirt, pants, boots, and a long black trench coat that dangled around their ankles. To top it all, they each wore a large, wide-brimmed black hat. Have you decided? Which one will you choose? The voice chimed in over the obviously live feed. Death comes on swift wings for our ill-fated friends. You must choose one. That is how the game goes. He thought this was a game? I was horrified. Was I really supposed to choose who died here and who survived? It was ridiculous, and I went to close the page down. Calmly, the voice began again. Before you close us down, you should know that if you do not choose one of the three shown here, your family will be next. I was startled by his declaration, but figured that he was just trying to scare me. He was doing a really good job, truthfully. Anna, he said. My heart skipped a beat. He said my name. Now I was officially terrified. I just wanted this to stop. Anna, dear sweet Anna, I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the night watchmen to their chore. The original videos came back up. And I knew that meant it was time for me to pick someone to die. Maybe it is just a horrible joke that some hacker and his friends like to play on unsuspecting deep web surfers. I stated out loud. It was more to make me feel better than anything, even though my heart was still pounding. I looked at the people again. There was a family of three. Children. I couldn't choose them. Then... There was the expecting couple. I couldn't do this. It was just too much. Choose. The normally calm voice barked at me. Choose now. I jumped and looked at the last one. It was the lonely woman with the dog for a companion. She had the least to lose. She was alone without kids or a husband. It wasn't okay, but I quickly clicked her video. Very well, so shall it be. The voice was calm and smooth once again. The videos of the Night Watchmen came back up. Night Watchmen, a choice has been made. You may attend to your work. I watched in horror as two of the Watchmen began walking towards the houses in front of them, and the third one walking away from a house. I was confused. I chose the lonely woman, but her watchmen were walking away. He disappeared into the night, and the feet cut off. The other two videos were bigger and took up the screen. What's going on? 
What's going on? That was all I could say. The two watchmen that it showed, each effortlessly broke into the houses. I was biting my bottom lip so hard it bled. The feeds walked along with them as they each silently roamed through the houses. One watchman walked into the set-up baby room and looked around gingerly, then made his way across the hall to the other bedroom. The other watchman walked slowly down the hall, seemingly trying to decide which room to enter. He chose the children's room. I looked over to the first one. He stood at the foot of the sleeping couple's bed, holding a huge machete. He walked to one side and began swinging wildly. There were screams so loud and frightened that I felt like I might pass out or throw up. I looked over to the other video reluctantly. The watchman stood in the children's room, right in the center of the pink bunk bed. He also brandished a machete. I screamed as he raised it up and reached over and pulled the computer plug out of the wall. I was terrified, traumatized. What had I just witnessed? What had I just done? My mouth felt dry. My head was spinning out of control. My heart felt like it might burst from my chest. After several hours, I decided to check my computer and hope that the nightmare I had witnessed was gone. There was nothing. Days later, I was checking my email when I stopped and recoiled in horror. There was an email from the Night Watchman. I finally opened it. I really don't know why. Maybe I was hoping they would tell me I had been punked or something. Instead, it was just a few large words on an otherwise white background. Jenna thanks you for excluding her from a Night Watchman fate. We thank you for your choices, too. We truly enjoyed our encounter with you. Come play with us again anytime. Attached was a picture of the lonely woman walking her dog in the park, still looking down at her phone. I will never, ever access the deep web again. Story number two, true dark web story. My friends say I'm a little crazy cruising around on the deep web like it is some place to hang out on my weekend nights. I used to have a social life with them, so I guess they're just jealous. When I started college, we would all hang out together. But then I got really behind on some assignments, and these weren't just some assignments I could just do overnight. It was almost at the end of the semester, and I was complaining in a forum somewhere that I hadn't read any of the material, and I didn't know what was really going on. That's when a guy on the forum named The Jester spoke up. He messaged me privately and said I could probably buy those papers off the dark web if I had the money. I was curious to see what he was talking about, so... I downloaded the app and started visiting the websites that he sent to me. I'm going to be honest here. I would have never found these sites without his help because their links are just insanely stupid. These were mostly scanned images of other people's homework. Some were only a few bucks and others were in the thousands. I didn't have thousands, so I bought a few papers that cost me between five bucks to a couple hundred dollars each. I figured I would take pieces of the best ones and put them together. I'd spend all night reading them and then work out something in the morning. I went through most of them and took notes. They were really well written and I was surprised to find how easy it was to actually cheat on a paper using other people's work. I wasn't plagiarizing the material but using them as reference points. I didn't feel like reading three whole months of text just to pick out the information for the assignment. If I could pull it off, then these would be good enough. A couple of the pieces were nonsense garbage. They really weren't that expensive and it didn't matter. It wasn't until the last one where I found myself wondering what the hell I had gotten myself into. 
I opened up the page, and it had hand-drawn sketches of adults and kids. They were naked, but they weren't explicit. At first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at and thought it might be some medical journal. But then I realized it was a butcher's diagram of meat cuts. The page looked used like they had been read many times and even used in a greasy environment. I read the descriptions and almost lost my dinner. These were recipes for some of the most popular dishes we all know and love, which included anything from sizzling steaks to stuffed mushrooms and lasagna. They talked about how to get the most tender pieces and where and from whom to get the cuts. There were pictures of the carving knives and pans to use. At the end of the booklet, which was obviously pieced together by taking pictures with a camera and put together in one big JPEG. There was a link to submit your own recipes. I freaking a link. I don't know how I managed to download this horrible monstrosity of a link, but I pray nothing was sent back to these people. I don't know what to do or where to get rid of it. Do I send it to the cops? The feds? Have I done something illegal myself? I really hope it didn't send these creeps my IP address. Story number three, the first time I went to a boy's place. I was around 16 at the time, so I was commencing at a new secondary school. During my early days attending this new educational facility, I met this rather charming guy we can refer to as Jacob. Even though Jacob was quite enticing, he seemed to show an unsettling amount of quirkiness. Not the quirkiness you'll see in those nerdy people who's into Marvel comic books like me, but the quirkiness that'll make you think that this particular person will be a potential serial killer. Being the pushover and overly friendly person that I am, I put that aside and became friends with him. One Saturday afternoon, Jacob invited me to stay at his place. I didn't have anything else to do, so I accepted the invitation. Around 20 minutes later, he picked me up and took me to his place, since he was able to drive. Upon arrival at his house, I take a look of the property. It was out in the bush, a big property with the main house, which his parents and sister lives, and a granny flat around 10 meters from the main house where Jacob lives by himself. I checked my phone for the time. It was around five in the evening, and I noticed that I have no reception, which is strange because Telstra, the phone company I'm with, is very good with their reception, and normally I can get decent signals when I'm out in the bush when I go to see family. I thought I was in a setting for a classic horror movie, but I humorously brushed it off in my mind. Once we settled into his place in his kitchen living room, he went off to go have a shower. As I heard the water being turned on in his bathroom, I thought I should do a little bit of snooping around. Nothing too privacy invading, just to look at the decor in his place and to see what his room was like. In the midst of all the snooping, I saw a variety of things. His old jersey when I used to play rugby, a few artworks he did since he's an art student, and a photo booth style photo of him and his ex, which I got kind of jealous about since I had feelings for the guy back then. The creepy part though was in his room. I had stepped into his room. At first, it seemed normal bed with a nightstand, desk with a high-tech computer, and camera, stuff like that. But as I looked around his room, a half-open drawer in his nightstand caught my attention. As I looked into the drawer, I noticed something that sparked up red alarms. A big, sharp butcher's knife, rope, BDSM-style handcuffs, and a bottle of something that I knew it wasn't lube. I tried to brush it off as Jacob just being hella kinky, but something in me knew there's something fishy going on. 
Maybe because of rumors I had heard at school about him doing some sort of fucked up shit. At first, I ignored them, but now I'm starting to believe these rumors. Shortly after, I heard the shower turn off, so I sprinted my ass back to where I was, sitting before he had a shower, and acted like I was trying to get reception. He came out of the bathroom, dried and dressed. He made an amusing remark about the reception here as he walked up behind to where I was sitting, and expectantly hugged me and scooped me up bridal style, and then he carried me to his bedroom. These sudden actions made me have a mini anxiety attack and a little bit fearful for my life. As he placed me on his bed, Jacob proceeded to go to his tripod next to his desk and prop his camera on and directed it in my direction. This made my brain say, get the fuck out of here now, as my heart was pounding in fear, thinking that he was going to rape or murder me and film this all on camera to put on the deep web since he told me that he visits deep websites frequently. Luckily, in these situations, I was always smart enough to escape and so I pretended to read a text from my mom saying that I needed to come home. I lied to him that my mom wants me to come home and said that she will pick me up. I apologized for my unforeseen leave and bid him farewell before I rushed out of his property once I was out of his granny flat. As I was one or two streets away, I called my next door neighbor to pick me up since my mom was out of town that night. Once my friend picked me up, I told her some made-up story on why I was here, and she took me home. Ever since that incident, I was scared of Jacob and lessened my time on talking to him. After he graduated, I blocked him on all contacts and never spoke to him again. That night was the most fearful night I had ever experienced. After that... Please take my advice and don't go to guys' places that live on their own. It's always interesting to me how strange and unusual my home state of Washington really is. Think about it. It's had dozens of serial killers pass through come from or live there. We have high rates of Sasquatch sightings, countless UFO reports over the Cascade Mountains, and more eerie little towns than a Stephen King novel. Between June of 2010 and July of 2011, I attended the Cascades Job Corps program in Cedro, Woolley, Washington. A rather quaint, albeit weird, mountain town which bled into neighboring Burlington and Mount Vernon. I highly recommend that if you're in that part of the northwest Washington, you pay it a visit. The area is absolutely beautiful. Plus, if you're feeling the need to give yourself the creeps, put on the thing to Twin Peaks on your phone as you drive around. Trust me, you'll love it. Cascades Job Corps was a beautiful campus, somewhat isolated from the main body of Cedra Woolley, with only one road to get in and out. The overall area has a sense of being an island surrounded by dense woodlands. As you enter, you see to your left after a short, narrow drive, an abandoned three-story building covered in creeping vines and other parasitic plants common to the area. To the right, you see the lush green yards dotted with massive trees of varied species, and behind them, you see the first of the four dorms. By this time, I feel I must make it known that the property, as far as I was able to determine, had only been a campus for the Job Corps program for less than 20 years at that point. According to the information I gleaned from back when I was a student, the campus had been built as an asylum for the mentally disturbed. The oldest buildings still standing when I was in attendance were originally where the patients were kept. 
which was made somewhat obvious when you consider the common areas were built with thick observation windows to look in, and all the windows on site were heavily reinforced. Given that this campus had once been a lunatic asylum, naturally many stories and legends cropped up, often being told to the new input groups of fresh students by people who had been there a while. Of those stories, the two most common that were told related to a little girl wearing a red dress said to haunt the halls of two of the dorms, and the other one of an angry Native American spirit that stalks the property at night. Additionally, you have stories of students hosting seances, using Ouija boards and summoning nefarious spirits, and all the other common spooky events one would expect from an old asylum. What I can say with certainty is that there was something about that campus that was supernatural. Myself being a cultist, I've learned over the years that certain places house a wide variety of very palpable energy, an energy that has a habit of attracting spirits, elemental entities, and negative forces. Why this is, especially for that campus, I can only speculate. My own theory is that because the campus houses several hundred students, ranging in age from 16 to 24, many of which come from rather turbulent backgrounds too long to list here, whose own energies and psychological traumas imprint on the land. This is only amplified when you also consider that many years prior to the school, the area had been open to untold amounts of people suffering from insanity and likely had been subjugated to a cornucopia of terrible procedures indicative to the time. Regardless, my years spent on campus had seen me encounter some unusual instances of the paranormal, the first of which happened one month after entering the program. I was sitting with my then girlfriend and our mutual friend on a bench, which was located outside an old church, which sat behind my dorm and was connected to the cafeteria and one of the storage areas. As we were talking, we heard a noise come from near the church, which was then surrounded by unkempt hedges and bushes, a very loud, low growl. Now, for the record, all of us were worried a wild animal had wandered onto campus. It had happened before, and the signs all over warned students about the possibility of bears, cougars, wild dogs, coyotes, and even porcupines. And it stood to reason that in that moment we were about to come face to face with a predatory animal. As we jumped up, we slowly began to back away my girlfriend and friend behind me pulling at me, though I kept trying to tell them not to run, but move slowly in case it was an animal. I was just about to tell both of them to remain calm when suddenly I felt a hard, forceful push on my chest, which staggered me back a few feet and almost knocked all three of us to the ground. Naturally, I was stunned. Nothing was in front of us, just open air, and yet I had felt as if two large hands had pressed against my chest and pushed me back with full force. And as I stood my ground trying to figure out what the hell had happened, I had been pulled away and forced into a run with my friends. Later that night, I would find on my chest where I was pushed two large red marks that looked and felt like sunburns. The second incident that happened to me was several months and two girlfriends later, around Christmas time. Normally, the campus is nearly vacated since most of the students go home for the holiday break. Sadly, my only family was too far to justify the trip, and so I opted to stay. Needless to say, I was the only person in my dorm for that break, which was great. I basically had full reign over the common area, could watch anything on TV, get first pick of the good snacks. It was great. Plus, the additional privacy was always a bonus. 
Halfway through break, I decided after lunch to take a hot shower and made my way into the stalls. I kicked on the water, let it run so it could get hot, and hopped in. As I was standing under the hot water, I felt a cold breeze on my feet, which was unusual since there were no windows in the showers, and the dorm room was heated consistently throughout. However, in that instant, I didn't think much of it. The very clear and loud sound of a child's giggle, on the other hand, I did think much of. So here I was, standing naked and covered in soap, alone in a dormitory, and I hear what sounds like a small child giggle right behind the shower curtain behind me, which prompted me to spin on my heel, throw open the curtain to find nothing there save for a very cold blast of air. And naturally, when you have something so random and creepy happen, the best thing I felt to do was rinse off, put on my robe, and book it down to my bay, or room, and lock the door. Now, had this happened when there were other people on site, I would have thought it was a prank, which was very, very common. Here's the problem. I'm in my dorm. I was alone, save for the RA who was downstairs, who also was a no-nonsense type of dude. I thought maybe it came from downstairs since the vents did connect, but again, nobody was there. I even later went back with a stepladder to look into the vent to see if someone put some kind of speaker or something in there to mess with whoever stayed behind over break. There was nothing. Not one damn thing. Evening, folks. This has been ongoing for some time now, but tonight it was particularly weird. Please excuse any weird formatting as I'm doing this under my blankets because I'm really freaking out. So, some context. I am 25 years old and I live on the second story of my building across from a big city. We have lots of houseless people in my area and there's a safe injection site right next to my home. I'll mention right off the bat that I have been houseless within my lifetime from ages 8 to 10, and grew up in the care of an adult. I completely empathize with folks who are having a tough go at things. However, I also value my safety, and my neighbor's safety for that matter. So I will preemptively apologize if at any point I sound frustrated at this ongoing situation. I'm mad at the situation that has plagued both the life of myself and the houseless man who is tormenting my building. This all started about a year ago when my partner and I were nearly attacked by this houseless man while downstairs in our parking lot. To summarize the situation, we had just gotten home where my partner was going to drop me off. We didn't live together at the time. We kind of do now, but only on the weekends. And as we said our good nights, we noticed the man pacing in the visitor's parking lot who was seemingly having a rough time. We kept our distance, car doors locked and windows up, and eventually the man got the hint and left. Just to set the scene a bit here, my parking lot has two sections. One is a public or guest parking area. The second is a locked gate with smaller locked doors for residents to safely park overnight. The gate requires a key fob entry and the door has a regular building key. Both were made with metal bars. This is important later. I got out of the car and proceeded to walk towards the door, key in hand. My partner started up the car, which caused the houseless man to rush back into the parkade and promptly attack the car. He hopped onto the hood, beating on the windows and trying to rip off the mirrors. I watched in horror as this terrifying situation evolved next to me. 
and Mayor 14 feet away. I quickly got my key into the lock and opened the door at lightning speed. The sound of my keys caught the attention of the man, and he promptly sprinted towards me. Thankfully, by this point, I had begun closing the door behind me. By the time he got to me, I slammed the door in his face and stepped backwards while he screamed at me. When my partner realized I was safely behind a locked door, he got into gear and drove away. Moments later, he called me and instructed me to get away from the door and safely upstairs. It was a good thing he did. I felt like I was in freeze mode. I couldn't move. My heart was pounding out of my chest as the houseless man screamed disgusting things at me, most of which revolved around sexually assaulting me and gesturing crudely at his groin and flicking his tongue. Ugh. I finally broke my fear freeze, walked away as he chanted, Pretty lady, pretty lady, want a taste, huh? These words are burnt into my memory. I rushed upstairs and quickly closed the blinds of my windows. I heard him still yelling and chanting outside for a good few minutes after. But then I heard something unusual. A lighter clicking. The silence was deafening as the lighter clicked repeatedly. Eventually, the clicks stopped, and he began laughing. I look outside, peering through the blinds. I realized he was attempting to set our building's wood fence on fire. Luckily, it had been raining, so the fence wasn't going to catch. I quickly hopped on a call with emergency services, who sent a police car and a fire truck. As soon as the cop car pulled up, the houseless man went ballistic and started screaming bloody murder. They apprehended him quickly and took him away in the ambulance. Months passed with no sign of him. But one day, a resident in my building reported being attacked by a man who matched his description. After that incident, we, the residents, repeatedly heard him crying, screaming, moaning, and laughing at at least three times a week outside our building, generally at night. He also started trashing and damaging people's cars when they parked in the guest parking lot. Thankfully, we installed a new gate last week that closes off the guest parking behind another FOB activated gate. The thing is, as soon as the gate got installed, the man left us alone. It has been a quiet week, and it's also been nice. But tonight, about an hour ago, I was laying in my bed scrolling on TikTok when I heard what sounded like soft sobbing. At first, I thought it was coming from TikTok, but after some scrolling, I realized it was coming from outside. I looked outside, and there he was, sobbing and pacing around in the back alley. He suddenly switched gears, though, and started jogging while groaning loudly and continuing to cry, while occasionally hitting or attacking the new fence we installed. He has seemingly left now, but I'm terrified at his new habit. I'm really hoping he doesn't start crying outside the building routinely. I feel really bad for the guy, and I also feel bad making this story, but the whole situation is really freaking me out. I don't feel safe in my own home, and I just need to vent. Thank you for listening. If anything else happens, I'll update you all later. It was early July. I was about to begin my senior year of college, but home for the summer. While at home, I met Lisa on Tinder. Lisa lived in the same town as my college and invited me to come stay with her for the weekend. I happily obliged because dat booty. The weekend with Lisa went great. We started dating. I returned a couple weeks later. It's now late July or early August. 2012. My housing for the upcoming year was going to be in our fraternity housing off campus. 
We had a main house, the big house, and a smaller house in the backyard, which we called the little house. I needed to clean up the little house I was going to be moving into, since it was left filthy by the previous tenants. Lisa offers to help, so we spend most of our time there. The little house was stockpiled with furniture that people had left for the summer instead of taking it home. There were probably six or seven couches stuffed into a tiny living room, so you literally had to hop from one to the other to navigate the room. We made a game out of it and made great use of them throughout the weekend. Sorry, bros. To give you an idea of the layout, the little house was a ranch-style brick home with three adjacent bedrooms at the back of the house and kitchen and the living room at the front. The front door entered directly into the living room. The side door, if entering the home, was off to the right on the far side of the kitchen. In the living room was one large six by eight glass window covered in blackout curtains at the front of the house. Okay, so here's the story. It's late, probably around 11 p.m. Lisa and I were tuckered out and we cuddled up on one of the couches to watch the London Olympics. She dozes off, head on my chest, and I'm left there happily pinned down. Suddenly, the front door knob starts to shake. I'm caught off guard because it's summer in an empty college town, and we weren't expecting anyone. It stops for a moment. The doorknob shakes more violently this time. Thankfully, it's locked. As I prepare to slide out from under Lisa to investigate, three loud bangs against the door as if someone was trying to kick it in. Boom, boom, boom. Their attempt to enter has failed. I'm partially relieved, but still aware there's two other doors where they could enter. Lise is awake now, delirious and frantic. What's going on? What was that? She yelled. I hushed her and told her to get up and go to the back of the house in a bedroom and lock the door until I personally came to get her. She refused. I demanded. She obliged and scurried her way across the couches and locked herself in the back bedroom. I run to the far side of the kitchen and make sure the side door is locked. It is. Back door, locked as well. Okay, we're all right, for now. Thinking to myself, weapon, weapon, uh, what can I use? Shit, I wish I had a gun. Maybe the brothers left something? Shotgun would be ideal. I see a hunting bow with a full quiver of arrows. No, uh, too cumbersome. Keep looking. Golf club, six iron, perfect. Everything is silent, aside from my pounding heartbeat and the faint sound of Lisa calling the cops from the back bedroom. I'm standing in the kitchen, so I have a view of both the front and side door white-knuckling the golf club, when suddenly the side doorknob starts shaking and there are a couple bangs on that door. Lisa screams from the back of the house, and I yell to the intruder, We are in here, and we call the cops. They'll be here any second. Leave us alone. The banging stops. It's silent. Dead silent. We wait for the cops to come. Lisa and I are back in the living room on the couch. Two full hours pass. It's now something like 2.30 a.m., and there's still no sign of the cops. I'm both exhausted from the adrenaline crash and angry that the cops hadn't come. We call them again. Operator. 911, what's your emergency? Hi. Yes, we called two hours ago to report an intruder, but... No cops ever came. Are you still in the home? Did the intruder make it inside? Yes, we are inside. They didn't get in, but I'm scared they're going to come back. What's your address? I'll have an officer go over and check out the area. Thank you. The address is 123, as I'm literally spelling out the address. 
boom, boom, boom. The front door is getting slammed or kicked in. I hollered to the 911 operator. They're back. Please help. Hurry. Officers are on their way. Stay on the phone. Keep away from the windows and doors. Lisa is freaking out. I'm freaking out. Wielding the golf club again. And suddenly, the entire front window, all six by eight, shatters to pieces. The glass is mostly contained by the blackout curtains, and I screamed. The girliest, most blood-curdling scream I can imagine. I stood up and started swinging the golf club wildly, hoping to make contact with whatever or whoever was coming into the house. Moments later, we hear sirens, and I can faintly see blue light swirling outside through the split in the curtains. A megaphone announces the police presence. They scour the area and eventually knock on the door. Apparently, someone did try to kick in both doors, and there were boot prints to prove it. The window was shattered with a malt liquor bottle. They ended up finding a drunkard from the trailer park nearby, who had been roaming the area. The next day, I bought a gun. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Innerscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Buzz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for remaining to be the pillar in which Back to Ashes stands on. And to the other subscribers and random listeners, thank you all so much for your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.